Uh, so uh, welcome to the second uh, practical class in discrete math. So we're now dual, we are in the class and we're also on uh, Zoom. So uh, there will be a twofold class. The first will discuss the home assignment and I will post the link to this in the chat. I think I won't uh, share the screen because otherwise you won't see the blackboard or the whiteboard. But uh, you can always uh, consult this in the PDF. So it's here, discrete math, practice tasks and Boolean logic. We have discussed some of them in uh, previous class. And uh, now, mm, well, we can. Ah, OK. So um, there are a few of them also available here. So again, sorry for the, for the picture. We'll try to make the whiteboard visible, but I, I could be invisible. It's, it, it's OK. Um, so um, let me sit here just to, in order for me to be visible. Uh, so we decided that from each, um, yeah, please come in here. Ah. Okay, so sorry, it's just a, a technical thing. So, um, well, we, last time we discussed thoroughly the first question. And from each of the other ones, we uh, discussed only one point of, say, four or three. So, well, let's go forward. Um, I will ask the people in the class for what we did and what we didn't do. So, uh, from, from, uh, from, from, from task two, I think we did the A, the first one, yeah? Okay, so maybe someone of you wants to do, well, I don't think we wanted to do everything, but let's do C. It, it looks like the most, uh, like the, the most long one or something like that. Okay, so who wants to show 2C? Okay, please. So, um, uh, okay, so please use about the board, please use this one. And try not to draw on the edge of the board, just on the board. Please, so what can I use to write? Yeah, I hope you don't mind that it's all recorded. So. <laughs> What I did is I rewrote this formula using using only conjunctions and disjunctions in order to make everything more visible. So once I like this. So from here, we may see that we have not Q over here as part of conjunction. So the, in order to satisfy this, it is obvious that we need to set Q at zero. And if we set Q to zero, 
uh, we have one over here, we have one over here, which means that this clause is already satisfied, and the only thing that, 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 that is left to do is to satisfy this one clause. So if we put Q zero, and we need to put both P and R to one, because we need to make this, or no, we, not, we need not, we just P and R may be arbitrary. No, they, they can they cannot be both zeros. I think yes. At least at least one of P and R should be one. And uh, can I write it this way? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> you can do it like that, but uh, uh, using arithmetic on booleans is not the best way to do it because what does it mean plus one plus one? This is basically the question. I see. Uh, I think. Uh, well, you just write it. P or R is one. It's it's just the same because. The disjunction works exactly like that. So here you don't need to do the square because we don't have negative in any way. Right. And also this disjunction makes the correct thing with one and one. What they call the Boolean sum usually is the exclusive form. So it's, it's one plus one equals zero just as in binary arithmetic, but it's not what you really wish. Right? So uh, the, at least one satisfying assignment is, I don't know, zero, one, one, for example. Zero, one, zero, or zero, zero, one. It's uh, all of them are good. So thank you. Uh, the better mark I think is coming. Um, so uh, let us uh, try. So okay, I think it's it, we are done with the second one. Everything else is done in a similar fashion. So here we have in all others we have just two variables p and q. You can just if you don't uh, arrive at anything more say sophisticated and clever, you can just write the truth table and compute the formula and understand what it's satisfying. In 2C, it's going to be a bit tedious because we have three variables, so we'll have eight lines instead of four, but again, it's doable. So, okay, let's try um, three. And for three, I think, again, we did A, which is uh, the girdle damage formula. It's P implies Q or Q implies P. So P implies Q or Q implies P, while counterintuitively, it is a tautology. But in classical logic, you have for any two uh, variables, you have either one implies the other or the other implies the first one. So it's always like that. And okay, again, we can do, um, well, we can do two, here I think we have, we can do, so yeah, I think for B, everything I want to understand is it's a tautology. Is this true? I think yes. So you have P implies Q, then P implies you want you want uh, people from the chat want three B. So let's let's do three B. Okay, who wants to show three B? So yeah. By the way, people from Zoom they also can speak up because uh, we have the dynamic now. We have the. Okay. Let's let's, let's try. We're in the seminar class, so we can just freely chat and discuss the problem. Okay, so the, the bad marker is here, the good marker for is coming. So it's, it's okay. I should have taken my own, I just forgot that such issues usually happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great, thank you. Take this one. Take this one. It's just better for the for the for the zoo. See? So I put the nine, nine, number three B. Three B? Yeah, three B. So for the, just for the people on the screen to understand. Okay. So, I just open up uh, the implementation of the sheet.
Well, you are just uh, writing the or any implications. So, okay, this is okay. You just wrote not P or Q. P implies not Q or R, not P or R. Then we say that here we not P. No, this is not correct because you don't have to negate this one. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 I'm sorry. I'm good. So here I am, so here's okay. And here's no, not, no, not, no, not, no, no, yeah, no, that, that's not bad, yes, you should be replaced, yeah. Yeah, yeah but what, what are you going to do in the, uh, you're going to have a DNF and you will check it for uh, tautology, okay. Yeah. There's no way in there, no. Probably, there could be the better one. The better one is just the dual one. We do okay. Come on, come on. It, it's okay. Mm. Yeah, it's okay. So, so how do you check whether it's a topology? Mm. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe try to open up the brackets, but we'll get we'll get a CNF and uh, checking CNF for being a topology. Well, this is easier, but you will get a vast number of clauses. Yeah, so, I mean, so the, the question. Yes. Can we consider this a CNF? No, this is a DNF. Uh, this one is a DNF. You already jumped here. Yeah, no, you can remove this by, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a DNF. Is it enough? But no, uh, you are doing the right thing, but now you have to use duality. This is what the what the main say idea of the first part of the course was. That this uh, so suppose that uh, so that I call this, I don't know, A. So A is a D DNF. And so we're talking about the tautological thing. So checking A for being a tautology is the same as checking the negation of A for being a uh, satisfiable formula, yeah? It's a tautology for no leaf, this negation is not satisfiable. So we have to just take the negation, and the negation of A is going to be a CNF. Mm -hmm. So it's a down. Just by De Morgan, it's just automatic. By the way, you, you didn't have to negate these premises there. They returned to the original status. But it's okay. Well, just, just write the CNF. Okay. And C, and not R. Great. So now you have a CNF and you have to check it for being satisfiable. How do we check a CNF for being satisfiable? I don't know. Reuse resolution, of course. So I have not understood the resolution. Okay, we'll, um, we'll try to understand uh, it now. So, so I suppose that we try different uh, values for one of uh, variables. And no, no, no. This is, this is ineffective. You will have eight. No, yeah, you can try eight possibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Table of truth. And yeah, did it truth table. But what is resolution? So we recall the resolution rule. So it's okay. A or not P, P or B, yield A or B. It's not a mistake. It is another A. Okay, that's good. Fine, fine. Um, okay, so these are four clauses. You have to apply these sort of rules. How can you apply that? I don't know. I just, uh, I don't get uh, the idea. Okay, the idea. Let's, under, let's understand it now. So, um, take one clause where you have a negated literal. Mm -hmm. Take another clause where you have a. I'm going to start the formula on the bottom right. What does it mean? This one? Yeah. No, it means that if you have this clause, uh -huh. You have this clause, you can add this clause. And, uh, and remove these clauses before we remove no, these we clauses. No, we do not remove them, we just add, we just. How do they relate? They are, so yeah, they are all in this CNF. Oh, this happens like Just to the CNF, there's a conjunction. You consider the CNF as a set of clauses. Yeah, just... And why do we write it like that? Uh, why do we write this like, like this? 
Yeah, just just a shorthand. Just no no not to write this uh, uh, long text that say if we have this and we have this, then we have this. It's it just well what in logic they call it rule of inference. So if you have the general rule of inference looks like this. We have say a one a k yield b. This means that if we would have the, the premises, then we can add the conclusion, add the corollary. So you see that if we have this and we have this, then it logically follows that this. Can you, can you please say this? If we have this. I mean for the rule. This the rule. rule you use. This, yeah, no, this is just a general way of writing the rules. The rule is, it has, should have a specific form in order to be a valid logical reasoning form. So this one is valid. So if we have A and or not B, and we have P or B, then we can deduce A or B, right? Because what does this mean? Again, I, I talk, talked about this uh, during the lecture today. So if we have, um, what does it mean that we have A or not B? This means that just B implies A, right? It's just by definition. The so implication is uh, not 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 B or A. It's B by And now you have P or B. This is the second premise. They are both in the same. So if we have this, if this is true, and if this is true, then also, and I write this line, which you don't like, because I have to write, and deduce A or B. Why? Because I have P or B. If I have P, then I can deduce A. Yes. Yeah. So you just uh, write like uh, first clause, then and second clause, and then again conjunction, yes. and the third clause. Yes. It's the same. It will be the same. Yeah. Yes, it will be the same. But just add a new clauses uh, to find new. Yes, you are adding new clauses which logically follow from the existing ones. Yeah. Okay. This means that if we obtain contradiction, then the CNF will be not satisfiable, right? And this rule works only for C and P. No, no, for, no, no, it, it's quite general. A or B could be arbitrary. But we use it for CNF because for CNF we have a completeness theorem. If using this rule, so if we get contradiction using this rule, the, the CNF is not satisfiable, right? Because uh, uh, satisfiability means that it's uh, true for a given uh, Assign, but the false clause, which is the empty one, is never true. But this is complete. So if we don't get contradiction, we get a satisfying assignment. This is the theorem of today's lecture. Um, so uh, you have to apply these rules to this. We can, we can remove this one, and you have to apply it and add new clauses to this uh, CNF. Probably we can search on this Q. We can search this Q from this and this. We yeah, we get Q. Okay, just write them down. Just uh, Q. P, not P, or not Q. Okay. We were close to the end, actually. Actually, can move on. Ah, okay. This works. It's not P. It's not P, yeah. And I actually were done. Because we have P, we have not P. And this means we are in a contradiction. So it is not sad. But now let's return to the original question. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't get. We didn't rewrite, we are adding new clauses using resolution. So, okay, let's see it right once more. It's an important thing. It's, uh, yeah. So, okay, this was the, so here we use phi. Okay, I will write everything. I will write everything for phi here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, let me explain once more. So, we have this not phi. 
which is a CNN. Yeah. So these are four clauses. This one, this one, this one, and this one. These are small clauses with one variable. These are long ones. Okay. Then we apply resolution rule. How do we do this? We have not P or Q here, and we get P here. This means that we can resolve Q using this rule. Yeah. So this says that P is true. This says that P implies Q. Therefore, Q should be true. Next, we can resolve this against not R. We have not R, and we have R or P or on P or not Q. Again, we resolve so R is not true. Therefore, this guy should be true. Yeah, we can, we can do this. There's a various way to obtain contradiction. So, what, but uh, we decided to resolve this against this. It's also okay. We resolved. We got, got this, not P or not Q. And now we have not P or not Q, but here we have Q, for example. Or we also have P, by the way. It's, but we did the following. We have Q and we have not P or not Q. We can take, we, we get not P. And now in our CNF, we have both P and not P. This is not satisfying because if you have both P and not P, then you cannot get any value for P. You, if you take zero, you will falsify P. If you get one, you have falsified not P. So therefore, this is a contradiction. Therefore, not phi is not satisfiable. But now our original question was about phi. So we took phi. Its negation is not satisfiable. Therefore, in its true stable, for not phi, everything is zero. Therefore, if for phi, everything is one. And therefore, the original formula is not always. We derived it using resolution. In the sense. So it's a dual thing. It's, uh, you could do derivation in classical logic using just uh, standard same model spawners rules. Here you uh, derive by contradiction using resolution. Okay, that's great. So uh, we did 3b. Maybe we could do also 3D, which is uh, what they call, this is Pierce law. P implies Q implies P implies P. So is that clear? Can we remove that? It is, it's just long, but uh, not far. Uh huh. Um, P implies Q implies P implies P. Does anyone want to do it? Okay, great. It's visible, it's still visible. I'll just check where it is. Uh, so this is like this is this. A and not B. A and not B. And not B. Okay. So uh, this is this is this is But no, it's not this one, it's this negation. You negated it just now. Uh -huh. So you no. just denote it by C, I don't know. And uh, so it's straight to put D here, please. It's there just for people who are watching us. So not C is. I just negate. Uh, well, no, what no, did no. you do? You say this is a, this, you, you, you took the negation of the implication. No, no, no. I just uh, wrote it from, remember. Yes, but here you, did, you applied it. Here yeah. you exactly applied it. So this is not C. It's not, it's a, this is the, 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 the negation of the problem. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, it's okay. It's no, okay. no, 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 no. <laughs> I didn't want this. So I... why, why didn't you want this? You can use it for a resolution. No. It's, it's not, nice. it's, it's very good. Okay. Continue with that. Okay, okay. okay. so not C. It's not C, it's okay. Not okay. C, not C. Yeah, not C is. Um, uh, 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 it's not C. This. Uh, or B. Uh, yeah. And not yeah. And then, um,
so what do you have to put the reference to? And now you have to, uh, yeah, you have this, this conjunction is under the disjunction. You have to use the distributivity yeah. to put it out. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, and we have conjunction. CNF, yeah. Yeah, this is CNF. Okay, and uh, this is uh, not B. This is not B. And this is not B. So it's not. Uh, it's not so satisfiable. C, yeah, not satisfiable. And so C. Yeah, C is a topology. Yeah. Just like that. So here we didn't actually need to apply resolution at any point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, we just translated the negation of our formula into C and F, and immediately noticed that it includes P and not P. That means that it's not satisfiable, and that means that its negation is so the original formula C. That this formula is a topology. So this is how it works. Okay, so um, task four. So we have 4B and 4C. What of these do you want to discuss? I think only one because we don't have time for discussing that. For B or for C? So what for C? Okay. What is for C? Okay, please. Constructed formula, and it's true if and only if all PQR are true or exactly one of them is true. So I started by writing out a truth table in this case. Exactly one of them is shown in this case. Zero, zero, one. Zero, one, zero. Oh, one. And, ah, so you just drew the lines which are, you, which are true. Yeah, yeah and the last one uh, is when all of them are true. So. Yeah, and from that we can, and data lines are false, so from that we can construct a DNA, DNF, which is this. So there would be a, a four clothes, because uh, there are four lines which are true, and they go as follows. Oh, okay, yeah, this is still visible. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I just don't want to squeeze it. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, this is visible. It's okay. So, the first line is zero, zero, 001, so we take uh, not P and not Q 
Yeah, thank you. So before going further, I would like to bring your attention on a practical application of this task for C. Actually, this stuff is used in electrical engineering. Uh, so how is that used? So suppose you have some, I don't know, lighting in a room, and you want uh, three uh, uh, switches to operate it. So suppose it's a long corridor and you have one switch in the beginning, one switch in the end, and another switch in the middle. And uh, each switch you want, if you toggle it, you want it to toggle the lights. So it's exactly what this formula does. Because it says that the light is on, so the result is one, if and only if uh, there is an odd number of uh, switches turned on. So either all of them are in the on position or exactly one. So this means that if you toggle one switch, the light will toggle because the parity of the number of switches will change. And using this formula, you can uh, actually design, well, maybe it will not be optimal. And uh, if you look in as how it is really done, it may be a bit different, but how do these switches operate? So in each, uh, so for each um, clause in this uh, DNF, so usually how do they do this? There will be the zero, which is the, uh, well, it's not zero, it's, uh, let's call it ground. So it's uh, the one, uh, one connector. And the second connector will just do the job. So you have to, if you, uh, if you do this, so this is the, uh, Input, if you connect it via the lamp with this, the lamp will light. If you disconnect it, this will not light. So, and now you will have to um, uh, to, to do uh, four different connections which can make the lamp work. So, uh, you will have this, then you will connect it via the lamp, and there will be four ways how you can connect it to the um, to the uh, to the source of and next there they are actually sold in the market there are switches which do perform this stuff so how do they work so here will be the switch p which should um, so this is the first real switch which uh, will do the connection so it should either switch on so this will be one two three and four so in the up position it should switch on only three and four and in the down position it should switch on one and three yeah no no uh, one and two so these are going to be one, two, three, four. And uh, in the upright position, P switches on three and four. So it's here goes in three and four. And the switch should either connect both of them to the source, or it flips and connects these two. And the same goes for Q and the same goes for R. And they're all connected one to one. And this means that, for example, if we are in the position where B is zero, Q 
Q is zero and R is on, then we will get that the first line will commute and will light the, the, the lamp up. If we toggle, say, R, then we disconnect it and we connect some other lines, but they will be falsified by other values. So this is how it happens. And uh, this is how it works. Actually, it's a bit optimized, and you can, if you look at the real commun communication scheme, you will see how they optimize this formula in order to make it work. For example, there have been an interesting question how can you do this parity function for many variables? What happens? You can think about this maybe next time we'll discuss it, how to do this electrical communication for that. Okay, just well, in order for you to understand that this is not just meaningless games of variables, but something that really is used in uh, real life. So this is why, actually, this, this uh, motivation is why we have to consider these weak logical systems, where we have only Boolean variables, nothing more. Because uh, this helps us to save money and uh, actually save uh, what, what, what we can call uh, robustness of the system and its uh, reliability um, by replacing, say, complex logic with some uh, very simple one. Because when we do booleans, we can implement it essentially just as physical switches. If we try to implement some more the high order logic just to implement an algorithm, which of course will do this as a, I don't know, program in a programming language, then, then we would have to, to install a sort of microcontroller there, which is actually a processing unit, which costs much, is not that reliable as just a physical switch, and uh, all this stuff comes here. So if we can avoid this, we should avoid this. Okay, so let's go further. So now 5, 5B, 5A, we did it before, so let's talk about 5. Does anyone want to show 5B? You? Anyone else? No? Well, let's, 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 let's invite you. Then. Like you could uh, take uh, 
Uh, so, but what, no. what, what was the question? We wanted oh, to make the tautology. tautology. Yeah. How can we make the tautology? Um, for DNF, well, we could do it there, but I think here it's obvious okay. from the form of the work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or what's the easiest way to make this a tautology? Only A is. Yeah, a is you can just make A a tautology. Yeah, but uh, we should find a formula for A. But we can but make it A, any tautology will go. Any tautology, okay, A is uh, B and. Well, not B. Yeah, so, okay, this is a good answer. So uh, if you have A in the disjunction, that if we say that A is a tautology itself, the whole disjunction will be a tautology. We can just take A as a tautology. This is the first answer. Oh, there will be many equivalent solutions. You can end, you can say Q and not Q or not Q. You can say P implies P or any tautology in previous assignments. I don't know, like for 3D, for example, you can put this here. This is the first answer. You can also make a not, not that trivial result by trying to set, so you cannot make this a tautology. Oh, yeah. Okay. But yeah. no, no, this is not a tautology. But oh, you yeah. but you can try to make I think you can try to make this. No, you can you gotta try to make this. Um yeah, so what I wanted to yeah, so what can you think about? So first, this thing is actually meaningless. Yeah, because it's nice. it's stronger than this one. So if this is true, then this is also well, no, if this is true, then this is also true. So we can remove this. So it's just equivalent to P and Q or A. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, you can just, uh, yeah. And you can just remove this. And now, how to make this a tautology? So you can either make A tautology, and this will do everything. But also, you can use uh, this. So if P equals Q equals 1, then A could be false. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So this means that A could be not. Yeah. The negation of that. P of and Q. P and okay. Q. No, no, no. So this is this oh, is yeah. false. Yeah. Because P and Q and everything is negated. So this is the second type of solution. Yes, it's the second solution. Yeah. Of course, it is all modular equivalence. So you can you can rewrite this in an equivalent form. I don't know, not P or not Q, for example. But the idea is that uh, our formula is equivalent to a very simple one. It's A or P and Q. And uh, how to satisfy it? So A should be true always when this is false, because otherwise we fail. So therefore, the minimal solution is this one. And the maximal is just the tautology. And this is the only two possible. By, by a truth table, modulate formula. Because you can, for each truth table, you can write many equivalent formulas. Infinitely many because uh, uh, you can just add in the conjunctions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we did, uh, yeah, and we're unfortunately a bit short in time. So we have three tasks, which are six, seven, and eight. They are, well, they are easy, but they're quite technical. So please, let's, uh, okay, let's maybe try to do one of them just from six, seven, and eight, just one. And uh, Everything else will go for your say for the next class because we have to start the new new topic now. Okay, so from six, seven, and eight, do you want to? Maybe maybe one of the points uh, was problematic for you. It's also a question for the people on Zoom who are, who are listening to us. Mm. Well, if, if all of them were doable, then we'll just go forward. No, for, for, for nine, it's, it's not the other question. We'll talk about it a bit later. I'm now talking about six, seven, and eight. Six, A? Yes. Okay, let's try six, A. <clears throat> and then, uh, so other people are asking for eight, A. Okay, maybe we'll also do eight, A if we have time. So, so start with six, A. It should be, it should be quick. When you, while you write, I will just say about nine. 
Uh, let's do it just the next week because we are short on time. So if some of you did nine, then just wait. If uh, you didn't do nine, then do it. So just because we, are, we have to stop at uh, half past noon and we all have to introduce the new uh, exercise sheet. So we won't, I think we won't have time to start solving it now and we will do homework, but uh, I have to introduce the, the notions there because they must be used. So it's a, a bit of small uh, mini lecture. Do we need to pass these exercises uh, or is it just for practice? These are just for practice. You will have, uh, after the first half of the course finishes, this logical part of Boolean and first order logic, you will have an official take home a lot of midterm or something like that. And you, these were official, you will have to uh, write them down and uh, submit as it will be part of your exam. And uh, this is just practice. I think uh, some people ask me, well, I'm talking all this stuff while uh, we're just waiting for the, for the blackboard. Uh, I was asked about the formula for the resulting mark, so um, it should be somewhere in the official documents on uh, the university's webpage. I will also duplicate it on the course's webpage. So how the final is computed. Is computed. So there is the, there will be two or three uh, home assignments, one written the theory, one or two for programming, depends on how fast we go. And uh, there will be the written final exam, theoretical one, and all of them have some weights, and they have a weight at sum, which is your final. So this means that uh, you have to both do well in the class and also at the final exam. I think if you do very well in class, there, there could be exceptions that you could uh, be exempted from the final exam, but I don't know whether it applies to this course. You have to consult with the subject. Okay, so uh, what is happening there? We are trying to transform a 6a into c and a n into d and f. So, uh, my question here, like, uh, I mean, is, is it correct up to this point? Uh, now let's, let's see. So, first, this is absolutely correct, of course. Then you took this and not r of d. This is okay, yes. Now you, took, you so, take this. Yeah, my question is can I use distributivity here? So, yes, like, you can. This one goes here and here. So, I yeah. can remember, I draw it right as yes. not D or Q or B and uh, not D or B. But this has like not D and B, and this is just one. So, Goes down to uh, uh, D, and this is both a uh, C and F and a D and F in a sense. Yes, and uh, but look at, if, if we're in doubt, we can check it. So the, this actually means not R or B; it means that just R implies B. Okay? Yeah. So let, let's check. So first, suppose that uh, this is true. So let's check that this is true. So what does it mean? It means that either R is false, but if R, okay, so if P is true, then this is true. Yes. This is okay. Suppose R is false, uh, then uh, let's think about this guy. So if R is false, then uh, in order for this to be true, so if R is false, then in order for or this to be true, it's either B false or B and C are both true. Uh, okay, so uh, if how can this be false? In order for so how can this be if this is R is false, if this guy is false, then the implication is true, it's okay. Oh, yeah. So yet if this should be true, how can it be true? Then this is false, then this should also be false. But if this is false, then P is true. Because if an implication is false, then its premise is true. And therefore P, is, uh, this, uh, this, therefore P should be true, and the implication is true. OK, and now the other side. Suppose this is false. What does this mean? It means that R is true and P is false. Yeah, R is true, then this guy is true, and this is false. The whole is false. So uh, what we did now, well, 
it looks maybe less understandable than what is done on the whiteboard, but uh, this establishes that the reasoning is correct. And this is the power of formal method, that when we try to reason like this in a human style, say, suppose this is false or suppose this is true, it's like school kids are reasoning about, say, logical puzzles. Uh, we immediately get into some uh, messy situation that we are always have to think that, well, all, did we consider all the cases and stuff like that? So in the formal reasoning and formal transformations, we get them. Okay, thank you. So there, there was a, a, also a question for 8A. Okay, but uh, let me just quickly do it because we are short in time and we have to go first. So, 8A. Ah, what does it mean? P implies Q implies R. Implies P implies not R. Implies P implies not Q. Well, the question was whether it is a tautology. Well, we can do it, by the way, uh, without writing down the CNFs and stuff like that. We can say, okay, suppose P is true if P implies not R. Okay, then by contraposition, we get not R plus not Q. Therefore, we get not Q. So this is just how people can make an intuition about that. But uh, let's uh, do the formal uh, reasoning here. We have to translate the negation into a CNF and do a resolution. So this formula called A, quickly, not A. Okay, there are many implications. So this is positive, this is positive, this is positive, this is negative. So we'll have a conjunction of P implies Q implies R and P implies not R. These are premises and Q, which is the negation of the uh, go. Okay, so these are implications, the implications are injunctions, so it's not P or, well, let's write it down in this bar notation, P, Q, R, not, not Q or R, and not P or not R, and P and Q, and now we resolve. I will write down the new clauses. What are the new clauses? So here is the not P and not R, here is P, so we have not R. Okay, now we have this, no, not P, not Q, so we have not P or not Q here. <coughs> Next we have not P, because we have resolved Q from here to here, it's true, that is P, with the negation, and we get contradiction. We just applied resolutions. Actually, this sort of exercise was already something like, I, did, I don't remember, something like 3B basically like the same. Okay. Can we say that we get contradiction at the point when we get not P or not Q because that's the negation of P and R? Yes, you can do this, but uh, these are formally speaking two clauses. Uh, well, you, you can find out, the but I just, formally speaking, you have to, to add this one here, which is the constant form. Mm -hmm. Formally speaking, we have to resolve this against this, get the empty clause, which is false. And then we just say we go to contradiction. In the algorithm, it will do like that. Okay, so we did AK. Now, unfortunately, we are short in time, but I will uh, introduce the new exercise sheet. So this is a small, uh, uh, actually, a small detour to more of complicated, more sophisticated logics, which is the first order of logic. Uh, we didn't have time to do this in lectures, but uh, it will be helpful for understanding uh, the theory of uh, P and P and stuff like that will be, will, will be convenient for us to use quantifiers. And for people who are on uh, Zoom, I will just also share the, uh, the link um, in the chat, I think. So it's the second exercise sheet. It's also on the course web page called Four Tasks. So, um, what is first order predicate logic? So, first order is predicate. Well, it, in Boolean logic, 
our variables were just zeros and ones. They were just, say, independent statements. So they're just a statement which is either true or false. In predicate logic, there are predicates. There are symbols which express uh, statements or propositions about some objects of the real world. Or this real world is called the domain of their logic. So of, of our inter interpretation of the logic. So what does this all mean? Uh, so, for example, we want to say that, I don't know, the standard example, true um, statement about Russian geography at Volga flows into Caspian Sea. So, in predicate logic, we, uh, in propositional logic, in Boolean logic, we uh, just say that this is an atomic proposition. We say that we call it, I don't know, P, and it's either true or false. But in uh, predicate logic, we can write down this predicate, F, which has two arguments here, which are substituted by variables, which, which represents the predicate to flow for a river. And the flow predicate has two arguments. So first we have a river, and then we have the place where it flows. So it can be either another river, or it can be a sea or a lake or something like that, or maybe even a desert, if just the river just vanishes. So this is a flowing predicate, and now the important part which comes here is that x and y are also variables, but variables of a different kind. So our p, q, r, and stuff like that, they were propositional variables. They were variables about uh, propositions. They had a value of 0 and 1. Here, instead of them, we have predicates. So we can consider a specific case of predicate which has zero arguments. This will represent our just atomic proposition, propositional variable. But here we have arguments, and these arguments range not among zeros and ones. They range about objects of a, what they call domain, or object area. And this area is denoted here by M. So it means that we can write, well, maybe a bit uh, not so formal logically, but I can write something like this, that this M. Well, it's not maybe that good to write like that because the variables themselves, as in propositional logic, they are just formal symbols. They are not, uh, say, um, they are not uh, they're not range of anything. It's just they're just formal variables. But this is just the intuition. About it. And what is about flow? So flow F is a predicate. It is a function which takes two arguments from the domain and returns the Boolean value, which is zero or one. So it is going to be is going to take its input from a Cartesian product of two copies of the domain, and it will return zero or one. So a predicate is a function with a Boolean value and with several arguments from M. So we use the same domain always. There could be also what they call multi-domain predicate logics, where you have different sorts of variables for different sorts of objects. So the one for rivers, another for animals and people. So like, here we don't do this because you can easily express it using just unary predicates, which say that you, there could be a predicate which says r of x, which says that r is a river. Just if it is true, then we consider it a river. If not, and then you can say Volga is a river and it flows into Caspian Sea. Or you can say something now. You can make some general uh, statements. So, uh, for example, you can say like this, uh, express something that if you have X, which flows somewhere, then X should be a river. How to express this? You will have to express this somewhere for all and stuff like that. For this, you can use the stuff which is called quantifier. So I can say something like this, for any X, if there exists a Y such that F of X, Y, so if x is such that it flows somewhere, then r x is a river. So I will add also this bracket just not to make any uh, priority suppositions, but do it like this. So we have that if x flows somewhere, so flows into some y, then it has flows. This formula, well, it 
should be true. So it, how about truth? So truth again depends on interpretation. Just in as in Buddha logic, uh, we have our atomic statements for each we postulate whether it's true. This is a, a Boolean assignment. Here also we have to assign some values to these predicate symbols. So this is going to be a binary predicate or a relation. Uh, R is a unary predicate. And if it is interpreted in the correct way that F is really the flowing thing and R is the predicate for river, then this should basically be true. But in general, this formula can be falsified. So for example, we can say that F is always true, everything flows into everything, and R is always false, and no rivers. Then this is going to be false. And again, uh, we have a notion of satisfiability, and we have a notion of being a, well, here we call it generally true, which is the same of being a tautology. There are formulae which are, are true under all possible interpretations of the predicate. And these formulae are going to be not just uh, statements which are true under a given interpretation of the symbols, but these are going to be the formulae which are just logical. How can you obtain such formula? Well, uh, the first and easiest way to do it is just to take a tautology and substitute an arbitrary formula inside. So for example, I say, let, let's take this formula and then next let's take four and take the negation of the very same formula. Uh, so this big formula is true under any values for R and F. We don't have to suppose that it has they have a concrete meaning. This is always true. But this is a non-interesting example of generally true formula. It just comes from a tautology. Um, there could be more interesting examples. So let's uh, take a look at um, uh, point one. Uh, so let's see about uh, 1b, for example. So this says that if for all x, p of x or q of x, then either for all x p of x or exists x p of x. Is this generally true? Well, it's not, it doesn't come from any sort of tautology. Yeah? Because the quantifiers are essentially used here. But is this generally true? How do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let, let's do some reasoning about this. No, so it's not, it's not true. Maybe it is. So what is P and Q? Oh. P is a function which takes any object X from the domain M and returns zero or one. And Q also. And then take a disjunction. So um, how can this be true? There are two possible cases. Suppose P is always true. Then this is here, yeah. So for every x, we have this. Now suppose that p is not always true. So what happens then? Then we'll have this whole domain m, and we'll have this area where p is true. So it's actually the p minus one of p. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the set of x for which p is true. So if this is the whole m, we're OK. But if this is not the whole m, they will have some points for which P is false. But the disjunction of P and Q should be still true. So in order to satisfy this here, you will have to make Q true. And therefore you will get this. So this is sort of logical mathematical reasoning which uh, says that this formula is generally true which i believe you cannot say about the first formula in this which says here for all this can be falsified just by saying that for example here you have p here you have q you always have p or q but it's not true that you always have p and it's not true that you always have q. so 
So if you always have a disjunction, it doesn't mean that you will always have one. That could be of choice. Yeah. So um, what about, uh, how do you reason about it? So here we uh, collected uh, exercises which are doable by uh, humans who can perform some reason. So people can just do sort of logical uh, argumentation as I did now and uh, understand that I think it's always true or you have what they call a counter model, which means that the negation is satisfied. So everything satisfies it in the same. Are there any automatic ways of doing that, like in Woolen logic? Well, and the answer here is no. This is the bad thing in which we'll actually finish today's seminar, that uh, first order predicate logic, and unlike Woolen logic, is undecided. So there does not exist an uh, algorithm which uh, decides whether a given formula is generally true or not, or purely whether it is satisfiable or not. So there are versions of resolutions, stuff like that, but what is the problem? The problem is that uh, in Boolean logic, you could just do brute force and just do a true statement because your interpretations were fine. So an interpretation of a Boolean formula was just an assignment of zeros and ones to Boolean variables, which one cannot say about first order logic. Because in first order logic, you have to range over all possible interpretations. And in each possible interpretation, you will have to find out whether the formula is true. And the interpretation has a domain M, and the domain M could be actually infinite because, for example, you can see number four, you have predicates and relations of natural numbers. In the classical examples, I don't know, like Fermat's theorem. So you have a theorem which starts with that for all x, y, z, n, something holds. You cannot prove it or disprove it by brute force. You have to invent something more clever. If you try a resolution, a sort of resolution which could apply here for quantifiers, there are also versions of resolution. But again, if you want to uh, try, for example, okay, you have to, so supposing your formula will have something like exists x, some formula of x, in order to satisfy it, you will have to find out this x, and again, you can range over infinite, um, infinite range, which is not algorithmically doable. Of course, everything I'm saying now is not a formal proof of understandability. Maybe there are more, say, clever techniques of doing that. But really, this is a mathematical theorem. We won't prove it in this course, it's beyond it, but uh, just as a fact that there is no algorithm to decide whether a given first order formula is generally true or satisfiable, which is pure. So therefore, when we're talking about first order logic, Mm. Well, uh, we always have these problems with algorithms. So therefore, between these very weak and poor in expressive power Boolean logic and these high order, very powerful but yet undecidable um, first order predicate logic there, we invented some uh, intermediate systems, which include model logic, description logics, uh, some fragments of first order logic, which are used actually in logical modeling of real world. So um, this is all beyond our course, but if you are interested, then please contact me and I will show you where these things are used. So um, now uh, what is going on? So unfortunately we didn't do much from this exercise sheet. So I hope that I told all the necessary uh, data for you to understand the formulations and try to solve it. So next class will start with, uh, it with uh, doing this exercise sheet and doing problem nine from the, from the first one, which is still for you. So the programming uh, home assignment, the first one will be handed out on the next lecture. Uh, please stay tuned and if you have any questions, contact me by email or any other way. So thank you and see you next time.